Well, thanks, John, for the introduction, and uh, thanks to the archives for inviting me, and thanks to all of you for coming out. Uh, I first became interested in the Sarah Graham murder case in oh, about 20 years ago as I was reading Fairbanks and Tuck's uh, 1915 history of Greene County, Missouri. And the authors referred to the preliminary hearing that involved Emma Malloy and uh, Cora Lee as uh, they were implicated as accessories in the crime. And he had, uh, described their preliminary hearing as the most spectacular court proceeding in the entire life of the county. And that kind of stuck with me. And I ended up writing an article about it for uh, the Ozarks Mountaineer. That's a defunct magazine that used to be published down in Branson, some of you are probably familiar with. And then later I included a chapter in my uh, 2010 Ozarks Gunfights and Other Notorious Incidents about the book. And then in 2012 I also wrote a chapter in my Wicked Springfield book about the Sarah Graham murder case. But still, even after I've you know, written about it three times, I just felt like there was a lot more to the story than I could possibly tell in a you know, relatively short magazine article or a single chapter in a book. So the ultimate result was the book that John just mentioned, The Bigamy and Bloodshed, which as he said was published in 2019 by Kent State University. That's the cover of it. That's Emma Malloy in the middle, uh, Sarah Graham on the left, and George Graham on the right. What made the What made the Sarah Graham murder case so sensational was the involvement of Emma Malloy because she, uh, as an accused accessory because Emma was a nationally known, even internationally known, temperance revivalist and evangelist. And there were a lot of people, especially drinkers and those associated with the liquor industry who were only too happy to see her brought down a notch or two. Uh, they considered her a holier than thou crusader, you know, so they were glad to, to see anything that her getting in trouble. This is a photograph of Emma Malloy taken about uh, 1877 when she was approximately 37, 38 years old. <coughs> and this is a uh, like a sketch or an, an etching, etching of uh, Sarah or Emma Malloy that was taken about the, or made about the same time. Probably might have even, even used the same photograph to make the etching from. They are very similar, although not exactly the same. So I don't know for sure whether whether the etching was made from that same photograph. But anyway, you can tell from both the etching and from the photograph that she was a fairly attractive woman also. Uh, born in uh, northern Indiana in 1839, Emma Barrett, Barrett was her maiden name, was a very intelligent girl. Uh, she was only about 15 or 16 years old when she began uh, submitting uh, poetry and essays for publication. And also along about that same time, she taught school for a year. Then, a couple of years later, when she was 18 years old, she entered into an ill-fated marriage with a printer named Lewis Prott. And they moved to Wisconsin. The marriage was troubled from the very beginning, plagued by Prott's uh, excessive drinking. And then when both of their children died in infancy, that was more than the marriage could take, and Emma divorced Lewis Pratt and moved back to Indiana, where she soon married a newspaper editor named Ed Malloy. Emma helped her husband in the newspaper business, and he soon made her a co-editor of the paper. The couple had one child, Frank, and they adopted another child named Etta. In her newspaper columns, Emma mainly uh, advocated for women's rights and sometimes temperance, and occasionally for other causes as well. However, she soon hit the uh, lecture circuit speaking mainly about uh, women's rights, and then gradually got into temperance also. Uh, by the mid to late 1870s, she was uh, talking mainly about uh, temperance issues. From all reports, she was a dynamic speaker and a mesmerizing personality. And her fame soon spread beyond Indiana to the rest of the nation and even overseas. 
1878, she voyaged to, to uh, England to uh, give a series of uh, temperance revivals or temperance uh, lectures in, in, in London and mainly around London. Anyway, this is the headline from a Boston newspaper that was published uh, on the eve of her sailing for England. Uh, a church there in Boston, I think this is from the Boston Post. A uh, church there in Boston gave a reception or kind of in her honor as she was getting ready to sail for England. In the late 1870s, Emma, who was active in the Women's Christian Temperance Union, became involved in prison reform on behalf of that organization. And she soon started visiting the Indiana prison state north at Michigan City. It's way up in the very northern part, of, uh, northeast part of uh, Indiana. There she met convict George Graham, and she kind of took him under her wing. And that would prove to be the worst mistake of her life. This is a sketch of George Graham that was, came out in a Springfield newspaper after the murder, you know, a couple of years later after she met him. But anyway, this, this was a, I don't think there is an extant actual photo of him, but, but this was a sketch made from a, a you know, newspaper artist made. Uh, like Emma Malloy, Graham was very intelligent and of a literary bent, and that's probably what drew her to him to begin with. Uh, and she kind of, like I said, kind of took him under her wing. However, he, unlike her, came from a very disreputable background. Uh, he first ran foul of the law when he was only about 10 years old, and he was in trouble with the law off and on until he finally got sent to prison when he was about 19 or 20 years old to Illinois for horse, horse theft. He was released after about a year, and he came back to Fort Wayne, Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is where he was from, and he ended up marrying Sarah Gorham, against the wills of the Gorham family, against the wills of her family, because they thought he was a, you know, well, he was kind of a disreputable character. And this is a, a sketch of, also a newspaper sketch of Sarah, Gor Sarah Gorham, Sarah Graham, her maiden name was Gorham. In 1873, shortly after the birth of George and Sarah's first son, Charlie, uh, George, was sent to prison, to North Indiana prison for horse theft. To give you an idea of the uh, kind of criminal background that Graham had, I'll read you just a short passage from the Fort Wayne, uh, one of the Fort Wayne newspapers uh, about what they said at the time. George has, not, George has not only been guilty of larceny, horse stealing, forgery, embezzlements, confidence games, obtaining money under false pretenses, assault and battery, and other eccentricities, but he has preached, delivered temperance lectures, studied law, been a telegraph operator and an engineer. He has been acquitted of numerous crimes, been declared insane by an Allen County court, etc. but now he languishes in the Michigan City Penitentiary. And what the editor of the newspaper, of course, did not know at the time was George Graham was far from finished with his uh, escapades. Sarah divorced George while he was in prison, but when he got out of prison a year or two later, they reconciled and, re and remarried. And then in the late 1880s, about the time that their second son, Roy, was born, uh, George got in trouble again, this time for forgery. Uh, he was then sent back to the North Indiana prison, and that was then that he made the acquaintance of, of uh, Emma Malloy. In keeping with his history as a kind of a scoundrel and a shyster and a con man, he, the smooth-talking Graham didn't tell Emma Malloy the full story about his uh, criminal background. For instance, he only let her know that he had been in prison two different times, not three different times. You know, he, he let her think that he'd only been in prison two different times. However, she was determined to save him, and she more or less adopted him when uh, he got out of prison about a, a year or two later in 1881. In early 1882, Emma divorced her second husband because Ed insisted on letting his mother and father live with them, and Emma would not live with him under those circumstances because she and, and Ed's father did not get along, or Ed's mother rather, did not get along. Mrs. Malloy got custody of uh, both Frank and Edda, and near the same time, 
20 year old Cora Lee and her younger uh, sister Emma came to live with uh, Emma Malloy as foster, uh, foster daughters. And this is a, a sketch of Cora Lee, who was the foster daughter of uh, Emma Malloy. By this time, Emma was editing a temperance newspaper called The Morning and Day of Reform. And she gave George Graham a job as a business manager of, of the newspaper. When Emma and her four children moved to Washington, Kansas in 1884, George and Sarah and their two children joined them. And both families lived together in the same two-story house. And this is the two-story two, two house that they lived in. It's still standing in Washington, Kansas. Uh, Washington, Kansas, for those of you who don't know, is located about 75 miles northwest of Topeka, or about go 45, 40 miles, almost due north of Manhattan, somewhere around, you know, up in that territory. Uh, I think the little section on the back has probably been uh, built onto it. The whole thing has been, uh, you know, re recovered. Uh, whatever, vinyl siding or what, but uh, it's still the original house. So. And this is a shot of downtown Washington where Emma Malloy had her newspaper uh, office. It was in, this is looking uh, on the west side of the square in Washington, and her, her newspaper office was located up in the second floor of one of those buildings, kind of toward the middle. I don't know exactly which one, even the, the local uh, historical society did not know exactly which one, but they did know it was in, one of those buildings kind of toward the middle, the middle of that uh, west section of the, of the uh, square. In early 1885, Sarah and George Graham had a falling out and Sarah took Charlie and Roy and moved back to Fort Wayne. But just a couple of months later, uh, in early May, Emma Malloy got a call to come to Springfield, Missouri to look, deliver a series of temperance uh, revive, uh, revivals at the First Congregational Church. And she brought her four children, including the two uh, foster daughters, along with her. At the end of her uh, series of lectures and her revival, prominent Springfield citizen James Baker helped uh, negotiate her buying a farm located out kind of to the west of Springfield between the uh, Springfield Brookline. And this map kind of shows the location of that farm. Uh, it's one that I kind of drew from a, I mean, I took a basic map and then I kind of added some extra stuff to it. But you'll see the Malloy farm is located closer to Brookline than it is to Springfield. I'd say it's about three miles from Brookline, about six or seven miles from Springfield, somewhere around in that. Uh, so that just gives you a general location of where it was. What close to Wilson's Creek is the same Wilson's Creek that the battlefield is named after. When Emma Moy first came to Springfield from Kansas, George went back to Indiana, but he did not stay there for long and he did not see his estranged wife. Instead, he showed back up in Springfield and in uh, about early June and declared his love for Coralie. Apparently the romance had been smoldering for some time, but it's not certain exactly how much intimate, you know, physical intimacy had, had taken place, if any. But anyway, uh, George uh, confessed, so-called so confessed, quote, confessed to Cora and her foster mother that he had been living in sin with Sarah back in Kansas because the, uh, they had gotten divorced. What he, of course, did not tell her is that they had remarried. Uh, Anyway, Mrs. Malloy did check to see whether there was a divorce, and sure enough, there had been one, but what she did not think to do is to check to see whether there was a remarriage. And so she ended up giving her blessing to the match between her foster daughter and, and George Graham, and they ended up getting married. And, uh, well, first of all, George came and started living on the farm before the marriage, and then just a month or so later, in July of 1885, uh, they got married there in Greene County. Upon learning of the bigamous marriage between the, the couple, Sarah Graham determined to come to Springfield before Fort Wayne and reclaim her rightful place as George's wife. 
George wrote letters to Sarah denying that he was even married to Cora and trying to talk Sarah out of making the trip, but she insisted. George finally agreed to meet her in St. Louis where he once again tried to talk Sarah out of continuing to Springville, but she would not be deterred. George, Sarah, and their two sons took a train to Springville where George put the boys up at a boarding house on the evening of September 30th, uh, 1885, telling them that he would be, be back to get them the next morning. Meanwhile, he continued trying to talk their mother out of going out to the Brookline farm, telling Sarah, quote, that he would, wrote, she would ruin him if, he did, if she did. His pleas fell on deaf ears, however, and according to his later story, they, uh, they walked the whole way and they got into a big argument as they got close to the, to the farm and he ended up uh, either killing her with a gun or stabbing her with a knife. They got into an argument and uh, it's not exactly clear whether he shot her or, or stabbed her. But anyway, this is where the entrance to the farm would have been located uh, that's what it looks like today. There were, would have been a gate there uh, about where that utility pole is, and that's where, according to George anyway, that's where the murder took place, uh, right, right around in there. Actually, there was a trail that went up through the, this was a, the Malloy farm, this is amazing, but the Malloy farm is still pretty much intact. It's like 80 acres, and it's not that far outside Springfield, so you'd think it would, it would have been taken over by housing development by now, and it, there, are, there are houses all around it, but for the most part, that 80 acres is still pretty much intact. And so this is still the farm where, where all this took place. Anyway, uh, those two little trees that kind of in the middle of that picture mark pretty much where the abandoned well was. He, uh, after he killed her, he took her and, and dropped her in, the, in that abandoned well there on the farm, uh, took her clothes off and dropped her new body in, in the well on the abandoned farm, or uh, abandoned well on the farm. In very early 1886, Sarah's relatives from Indiana, worried about her well-being, came to Springfield to search for her and also to file bigamy charges against George Graham. And this is the headline that came out in one of the Springfield newspapers after the bigamy charge was filed. Uh, it doesn't say there that he was arrested for it, but he, well, he was arrested and put in jail for bigamy. After Graham's arrest on bigamy charges, the search for his estranged wife intensified and Sarah's decomposed body was found at the bottom of the, of the abandoned well in late February 1886. Investigators ruled that he had been shot and a murder charge was added to the bigamy charge against George. And that kind of, kind of tells the whole story. It's, a, it's another headline from a Springfield newspaper and it, it pretty, like I say, pretty much tells the whole story of, of the murder and uh, what happened in the aftermath of, of it there. That first grant, Graham denied knowing anything about the crime at all, uh, the murder. Uh, but he finally, after a couple weeks, confessed uh, and admitted that he did it. But he insisted, however, that he had killed Sarah with a knife, not with a, a pistol, not with a gun. And the bullet that supposedly killed, you know, according to the prosecution, the bullet that supposedly killed her was never found. You know, they did an autopsy on the body, but they didn't find the bullet. So it's really kind of, you know, don't know really know. George had a history of lying, so you know most of the time he lied, but in this case he might have been telling the truth. I don't know, because they never found the book. Cora Lee was charged as an accessory before the fact to the crime because the prosecutors thought that she was actually in on it, you know, helped plan it, and might have even been in on the actual shooting. Uh, Emma Malloy was away on a lecture at the time of the murder, to her, yeah, at the time Sarah disappeared and was presumably murdered. Uh, and so she was only charged as an accessory after the fact because they thought that she uh, shielded George Graham from, from
from arrest and, and such as that, you know, tried, tried to, to, and also, you know, hit, tried to hide the crime, tried to shield him from arrest. And anyway, they were both arrested and, and temporarily put in jail. Uh, uh, Cora Lee stayed in jail. Emma Malloy got, got out on bond just almost immediately. She was just she was released on bond real, real quickly after they got put in jail. But they were both uh, charged as, as accessories and, and incarcerated. Cora Lee and Emma Malloy's preliminary hearing was held during the month of March 1886 while Graham was still in jail on the, the uh, bigamy charge before his preliminary hearing on the murder charge had taken place. Uh, the legal proceedings against the women turned into a really, you know, spectacular, uh, had a lot of curious uh, spectators who flooded into the, the courthouse and the courthouse there on, on the Springfield Square was was uh, just crowded every time, you know, every time it was in session. And uh, this made headlines across the country. It was just really a spectacular thing. And this is the courthouse where the legal proceedings took place. It, it's not where the courthouse in Greene County in Springfield now is located. This was on the corner of the square and College Street, where the College, which is the West Street, the street leading west out of, out of the square. It's where College Street comes in, came into the square, and on the northwest corner of that intersection. And the little building you see behind the courthouse, or kind of to the left of the courthouse, is the jail. What was already a closely watched uh, case took a sensational turn when Charlie Graham, George and, and Sarah's 13-year-old son, took the stand to testify. And this is a sketch of, of Charlie Graham, as I say, he was their 13-year-old son. Charlie said that uh, he had seen Emma Malloy and his father together in a number of intimate situations. For instance, he said he had seen her sitting on his father's lap and had seen them on the same bed together. He once also said that he, he had once even seen Emma Malloy, Cora Lee, and his father, all three, in bed at the same time. Uh, of course, he didn't say that they, he saw them having intimate relations, or he didn't even say that they were unclothed. But still, this was scandalous stuff in 1886, you know. Didn't take a, didn't take a whole lot to be real scandalous in 1886. Uh, George Graham had supported the women at first and adamantly insisted that they were not guilty and had nothing to do with Sarah's death. However, he turned against Emma Malloy when she finally quit believing his lies. Midway through the women's preliminary hearing, Graham wrote a long letter from his jail cell that turned out what was, turned what was already a sensation into a full-blown scandal. Uh, this was published in Newspapers all across the country. It was published in the Indiana newspapers, Leavenworth, Kansas, Chicago. It was it was a had a lot of publicity. Graham claimed that he had been having sex with both Sarah and both uh, not both Sarah, both Cora Lee and Emma Malloy for about two and a half years prior to his marriage to Cora. And he named specific times and places where he had rendezvoused. He said that he had impregnated Cora three different times and that each time she had gotten an abortion. The ac accusation so prostrated Mrs. Malloy that they had to, dis or had to you know, delay the preliminary hearing. After it resumed and, and then concluded, both women were bound over for trial, Emma on a charge of being an accessory but after the fact to murder and Cora on a charge of being an accessory before the fact. While awaiting trial, Emma Malloy set about preparing a thorough rebuttal of George Graham's salacious charges against her and Cora. She started collecting affidavits and other evidence showing that she was elsewhere at many of the times when George said she was meeting with him. Mrs. Malloy had not yet published this statement uh, when the spe spectacular Sarah Graham case added yet another sensational twist. A mob from Brookline broke into the Green County Jail at the rear of the courthouse in the wee hours of April 27, 1886, and dragged George from his cell. 
They took him to a spot just north of Grant Beach Park. I don't know if any of you are familiar enough with Springfield to know where Grant Beach Park is. But they took him north of Grant Beach Park and strung him up to a, a rope. And this is a headline about the lynching. Lynched at last. <laughs> Needless to say, George Graham was not a very popular person. And this is the approximate location where the lynching took place. It's now an elementary school, Weaver Elementary School, but it's, uh, uh, it's on Division Street, faces Division Street to the north. And then between that uh, elementary school and to the south of the elementary school is Grant Beach, and then somewhere right in either between those two places or actually on the school grounds is where the, where the lynching took place. And this is this uh, kind of map that I drew just to kind of show the orientation of, of the square in relation to where the lynching took place and such as that. You can see the courthouse there on the square uh, with the arrow pointing to it. And then kind of in the north or upper left-hand corner, you'll see an arrow pointing where it says the lynching site. And then there's also a low arrow down the lower left-hand corner pointing to how you got to go to Brookline. And then kind of in the upper right-hand part of the map, there's the Congregational Church where Emma Malloy held her, her lectures, her, her evangelistic work. Several letters and statements that Graham had written before his death were brought to light after he was lynched. In one, he not only reiterated that Coralie and Emma Malloy were entirely innocent as far as the killing uh, Sarah was concerned, uh, he also said that, that his uh, charges against Emma Malloy were, uh, you know, made up, that he, he, he uh, denied or disavowed the statement he had made accusing Emma Malloy of uh, immorality. Emma issued her own statement shortly afterwards, but some people criticized her for not answering char George's uh, charges sooner. She said that part of the reason why she had not was that she was afraid of inciting the very type of uh, mob violence that ended up happening anyway. And also she was taking time to find evidence and affidavits that would actually prove that she was innocent, not just issue a denial. And then this is the headline that came out after she issued her big statement, the big long statement. Uh, this is from the Indianapolis uh, Journal, and as you can see from it, they really, they totally believed her, her denials. They, they said that the affidavits fully and conclusively uh, saw, showed the falsity of the statement made by the man who was lynched in Springfield. Well. Well, some newspapers did believe her, but not all of them did. A lot of the newspapers still thought she was probably maybe guilty, you know, of, of being some kind of accessory or, or whatever. I'll read just a short uh, passage from her, her rebuttal or her uh, denial to give you an idea of her writing styles. Not only, I said while ago that she was an eloquent speaker, but she was also an eloquent writer, you know. This will kind of give you an idea. There are no two classes of people whom the world so readily believe a scandal about as a minister of the gospel and a woman. And Mrs. Malloy, of course, happened to be both. She then continued, when the two characters are combined and a scandal can be concocted sufficiently ingenious for the public to swallow, however nauseating and polluting it may be, it is devoured with an ecstasy of delight. It matters not, not that hearts may break or lives go out in grief if but these human vultures of society may fatten upon the slain reputations of others. And so that just kind of gives you a, a, a little bit of a taste of her literary style. Uh, when Cora Lee finally went on trial in June of 1887, the proceeding ended in a hung jury. Uh, the, it was reportedly split eight for conviction and four for acquittal. Uh, meanwhile, Mrs. Malloy received a change of venue to Christian County, that's where Ozark is, and then later a continuance. At Coralie's second trial in January of 1888, 
uh, there was much less, uh, you know, a lot of the furor surrounding this case had kind of died down, and also some of the jurors were new to Greene County and less familiar with the case and probably a, were able to, to view it through a little bit more objective lens. And so anyway, Cora Lee was acquitted uh, on a unanimous vote after only like seven minutes of deliberation. It was pretty clear cut uh, and very. After Cora Lee's, uh, uh, let me show you that. This is a headline showing and announcing that Cora Lee had been acquitted. Like I said, this took place in January of 1888. After Cora Lee's not guilty verdict, the charges against Emma Malloy were dropped. Emma then resumed her temperance and evangelistic work on the West Coast, mainly in the state of Washington. Uh, but her reputation was stained and she never regained the fame that she once had had. She died in California in 1907 at the age of 67 and her remains were taken back and buried in the state of Washington. I guess that's mostly what I wanted to say. I had to prepare text. I usually just talk like this, but I felt like I couldn't, there'd be too much important stuff I would leave out if I just tried to remember it all. But anyway, I think the thing that strikes me about this case, I feel like I know quite a bit about uh, Greene County crime. Uh, in fact, my most recent book, I have one coming out shortly, but my most recent one that has not come out yet, uh, or that has already come out, is about Green County crime, about notorious crimes in Green County. So I feel like I'm pretty familiar with Green County crimes. I think I can venture to say that what the Fairbanks and Tuck said about this case 107 years ago is still pretty true today. It's probably the most spectacular uh, court proceeding in, in the entire life of Green County one of the most spectacular in, in the whole state of Missouri, I, I would argue. Uh, it's just hard to imagine how much, you know, news, uh, headlines and stuff this thing generated. And I, and I, I said it mainly because of Emma Malloy. They just uh, were glad to see her brought down. Uh, what's, one thing somebody might be wondering is, were they really guilty? You know, <laughs> I think they were really guilty. Uh, I feel pretty confident in saying that neither one of them were guilty of, of being accessories in the crime. Uh, I think Emma Malloy was guilty of being gullible. You know, she kept thinking that she could save this guy when she, he was, you know, he kept lying to her and, and she kept falling for it and thinking she could save him, but uh, she couldn't. Uh, no one could have. Uh, Cora Lee, I don't think, was guilty because her sister and Adam Malloy, the, the Emma, Emma's uh, adopted daughter, slept with her on the night that, that the murder took place, and they both swore that she stayed in bed. And all, and I don't think they were lying. They, they both swore that she was in bed with them the whole time. So I don't, besides, the whole thing, is, is the way I look at it, George's whole motivation for killing his wife is he didn't want Emma Malloy and Cora Lee to find out that, that he was still married, legally married to, to Sarah, you know. It was he, that's why he did, to cover that, try to cover that up. But anyway, as for the question of whether uh, some of the charges of immorality against uh, uh, Emma Malloy were true, that's a little more iffy, but I still kind of come, tend to come down on her side for the main reason that she and Cora Lee remained friends through this whole thing. You know, I mean, imagine put yourself in Cora's place if your foster mother was having sex with the, the guy that you were in love with and wanting to marry, would you have stayed friends with her? You know, no. You know, so I don't think Cora, Cora believes she was, and so, so that makes me think that it's probably what, you know, because uh, like I said, they stayed friends, even not all through the whole thing, but even after it was all over, for years later, they remained friends. 